Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Rosen. I am a member of the civic engagement uh, team that is presenting the civic engagement sub summit for which you are a part of this afternoon. This uh, afternoon session is called Running for Office 101. This is gonna be a panel regarding the importance of civic engagement by young lawyers. We have several panelists with us, all of whom have experience running for office and who themselves, three of them are currently active members in office. And so I'm gonna introduce them to you now and then we're gonna engage with them in a conversation. Uh, we hope you submit questions. We'll have a chat feature. You could just type them into the question and answer component of your dashboard and I'll make sure that our panelists see and respond to those questions. As always, if you are not speaking, if you could please mute your microphone, we just wanna make sure that everyone is heard as clearly as possible. Um, this event will go until 1.15 Eastern time. After that, we encourage you to continue participating in the civic engagement subject uh, summit rather. The 1.30 event is called How to Watch the Watchmen. It is a program reg regarding understanding police oversight models and advocacy methods. And that is for CLE credit. So if you wanna continue on with us at 1.30, that will be the program then. So turning to our panelists today, we are joined by Mike Policiotti, who is the Washington State Treasurer. We are joined by Billy Sutton, who's a former state senator coming to us from South Dakota. And with him is Susie Pranger. She was the campaign manager uh, for Billy Sutton, and she too has recently run for office herself in 2020. And James Torrance joins us from Baltimore City, where he serves as a councilman in District 7. So good afternoon and good morning to our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start with uh, you, Billy, actually. I just want to hear from you about what caused you to pursue a position in office? And if you can start guiding us through what steps you took to get there. Yeah, you know, my journey is kind of unique. I never saw myself uh, running for office. I grew up in a, on our family ranch and got into rodeo at a young age, actually. And that's really all I wanted to do was rodeo. And I was very focused on that. I had a good rodeo career. And as so often happens in life, it got... Uh, my plans didn't really pan out. Um, I had a rodeo accident back in 2007, had a horse flip over on me in the chute, and I broke my back, was instantly paralyzed from the waist down, and my life got set in a completely different direction than what I had planned. And I came home, and I think one of the takeaways that that I realized is I I'd never thought about office, running for office, but I had an individual ask me to consider it. I think that's one of the important factors in, in people running for office is somebody actually asking you to, to take a look at it because it's something I'd never really considered. I had some history of like family serving. My grandpa served in the state Senate in the seventies and ran as a Lieutenant governor candidate um, in 1978. And then my grandma had also run for statewide office but it wasn't something I was really interested in. But after I got asked, that's when I started looking and, th and thinking, well, maybe I should. And I looked around and saw what was happening in South Dakota politically, and it seemed very frustrating. Uh, lack of education funding, lack of support for health care, uh, lack of like real economic development focus. And so I decided to run and uh, I, I won. Um, and the rest is history. I, I served eight years in the state Senate. I was termed out and then I ran for governor. And I lost one of the closest governor's races in, in South Dakota history. Uh, we hadn't had a Democrat elected to be governor since um, 1978. And I lost by three points. And it was a very, very close race. Um, and something that I'm glad that I did. And I look back on my time in public service and I don't regret any of it. I mean, it's it's been a really great, really great journey. I was able to have a really positive impact even um, as a member of the minority party in a very red state, um, I found ways to cross the aisle and get things done um, just by finding common ground. And I think that's one of the reasons I was, we came so close in that, in that governor's race as well, is just my ability to, to find common ground with people that I might disagree with on a lot of issues, but you can always find things to, um, to agree on. And having that focus allowed me to have a lot of success that way. So. That's kind of my um, quick spiel on how I got involved in public service, and and it it's really important. I certainly think finding common ground with your constituents is really helpful in any elected official position. James, I know that you uh, recently started this councilman position. Can you talk to us about how 
how your path led to the successful campaign that you put on? Um, it's interesting because the campaign season was during um, COVID-19. So I felt like uh, the primary kept being moved. And every time it was like, this race just got longer, another leg, another leg. But before that, I've been in politics since I was 14, started knocking doors for a mentor, um, saw it as an opportunity to like fight for my community and transition from there to going to college, being involved, staying involved in the Young Democrats, being SGA vice president while I was in college, and then eventually became a chief of staff for a state senator. And it was interesting being the youngest chief of staff in the room at the time at 22, and navigating the fact that I have a senior member of the Senate whose career is also in my hands as well <laughs> after working on her campaign. So we were pushing through a lot of things that were popular and also unpopular. So an alcohol tax was unpopular at the time, but we figured out an agreement between not only conservative Democrats, but liberal Democrats to get it done. Um, Maryland's a little different beast where we have some rural Democrats who tend to be more conservative than others <laughs> and we have to find common ground and it's it's interesting because in maryland our both our house and our senate are super majorities for democrats so it's often in fighting amongst the party to figure out where we're going to go um but on top of that i stayed connected and then went on to become a mayoral fellow helping in baltimore city and i've stayed somehow connected in the political realm and then long behold i moved into my wife decided to move to uh, a beautiful neighborhood and we were settled down. I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna go and do some lobbying work, do these things. And then a friend calls me and says, I think you should run. <laughs> Similar to Billy, someone asked me and I'm like, I like being behind the scenes. I get stuff done behind the scenes. And then I saw the landscape and was just like, yeah, this person's not gonna get it done. <laughs> so I stepped out there and then it's interesting because the persons that run the race before me are out there for over a year. I had eight months to make up the ground. So using my old campaign skills, I knew I'd out knock them, out raise them. <laughs> and that's what we did. We made over 64,000 calls, hit over 12,000 doors. We were, we were, we were out there. I was out there in 30 degree weather knocking doors <laughs> just to win a race and just being determined. People remember when you knock on their door and it's snowing outside and you're asking them for their vote. People remember when you're knocking on your door and it's raining. But also, I'm in a district where a lot of my residents, um, I'm in a multicultural district, I put it this way. Uh, my district is about 49% Black, but 39% White and others. And it's a mix of race, class, and gender. I have, majority of my voters are women. So a lot of my issues were geared towards not only women, but also geared towards the message of how can we all thrive together and making sure that people look at where we are in terms of this crisis, but just appealing to people's common sense and their common will to help others. And long behold, I'm here now, six months in, and we're still trudging along. We're getting through the recovery efforts and realizing that a lot of our industry is based off of tourism, so we're figuring out how to support that, but also addressing some of our systemic issues. Happily, our mayor decided that we're going to buy a hotel so for our homeless population, so we're all interested. We're trying to change the dynamics of where we are and address some systemic issues, but we're doing it differently through data. So I have a lot of issues where in my district, I have a large number of persons who are returning citizens. And unfortunately, because of what the data tells me, they're more likely to perform to either return to prison or be the offenders of violent crime or even our murder victims. So a lot of my work has been focused on getting office of returning citizens, expunging records, creating opportunities to make sure that we're addressing their needs, especially the women who are returning citizens so that they become moms again, but also we're helping them navigate that process because the duality for women is hard and we have to fill in those gaps for those families. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, James. And, you know, James, you touched on balancing, you know, making all these calls and going to all these meetings and really taking in the concerns of your immediate constituency. Susie, when you served as a campaign manager for Billy, can you talk to us about what, um, what kind of knowledge and skills you can bring to someone who's just getting their feet wet and running this kind of campaign and what's important to think about that we may not know to consider even? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for uh, people who are deciding to run for office to be surrounded by people who can, you know, help them carry out the campaign. Um, you know, even if it's a it's a little race. Uh, for example, I actually ran for the state legislature in 2020. Um, and even though I have a, a, you know, a history of being a campaign manager and haven't been involved in campaigns in the past, it's just so important as a candidate, you just can't do it all. So it is just so important as a candidate to identify people that you trust because they're going to be making important decisions on your behalf. And the people who tend to run for office are busy people, right? They, you have jobs, you have lives, you have so many things going on. It's just so important to build that network um, of people who, again, you can really trust to, you know, when something pops up, they're gonna make a decision um, that reflects you and your values. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's what I would sort, you know, if you're thinking about running for office, I really would think one of the first steps is really just identifying that circle of people around you, um, who has maybe done this sort of thing before, um, who maybe hasn't, but would be an incredible supporter of you. Maybe that, that's people in your friends, uh, in your family, uh, maybe that's people in your professional networks. Um, I really think that that's just a really key first step. Um, if you're considering running for office, because you got to have the people uh, with you to help you get it done. And I'm sure uh, that James and, and others as well could attest to how important that ne network of people to support you is when you're running for office. And Mike, you've, you've got this incredible position being the treasurer for the state of Washington. What advice can you give to young lawyers who are seeking a position like yours? Well, I think a lot of the comments we've heard so far uh, are, are spot on in terms of uh, kind of how to get a how to get a campaign going and uh, trying to figure out why you want to run in the first place and and kind of what what drives you. I mean, I was, you know, lucky through my service in the uh, ABA and the ABA YLD that um, you know I was able to you know I've I've friends all over the country like like many many of you do as a result of that and that actually helped a lot when I was getting a campaign going because when I first ran for office in 2016, um, you know, I was running against an 18 year political incumbent. Um, and uh, needless to say, you know, fo folks aren't, aren't, aren't thrilled, even if they love everything about you as a candidate, every, if they like your messaging, if they want you to win, um, it's, it's hard to run against an incumbent. And, you know, it made a big difference, you know, for me having support um, from folks all, all around the country who, who, were, who were friends um, through my service in the ABA YLD. To kind of help get get things going, um, you know. And I sometimes I wonder if we even would have been able to get the traction we 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 had in that cam campaign. Where actually, you know, we won in twenty sixteen um, in that state house race. Uh, if it weren't for kind of your network of of friends, so, you know, I think Susie was talking about, you know, surrounding yourself. Um, you know, there's talk of like a kitchen cabinet, something like that, where people that you can trust. You know, but you also need to be able to evaluate kind of that 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 larger reach of of other folks that you trust and that that are friends that that really can help uh, get get a campaign going. And and I think that's something to think about if you're thinking about running is making sure you're starting to figure out who who those those friends are, people who would like to see you uh, uh, see you be successful. And um, uh, you know that that's one of the first things I guess I would be thinking about if I was thinking about about running is, is what's what's that base of support both both locally and and wherever your base of supports come either family friends uh, and, and other networks and this is a question for any of you but it can be intimidating as a young lawyer to kind of step into this arena where you're surrounded by persons with much more experience or age or access to resources um, as you know young attorneys who are you know just starting their legal careers um, any advice on, on building that confidence or how best to approach more senior uh, politicians or uh, persons on these kinds of positions to get support from them or build common ground uh, in that kind of community? I think it just kind of takes perspective um, from my view. Uh, the way I kind of looked at it like, uh, well, should I run? Well, what, and then just think about like, what's the worst thing that could happen? you could lose. And then you're in the same situation you are today. And so just take, having that perspective and not being afraid to take a chance um, because it just might be the best decision you ever made uh, to, to take that chance. And uh, you know, then it, then it comes down to you know, building that network, finding people that you know are gonna support you as so many others mentioned. And honestly, uh, unfortunately, the reality is a lot of elections are about money and building resources to get your message out. 
And, you know, like, like Mike was saying, you know, I, I'm guessing he had a lot of connections throughout the country that knew him and would support him, you know, financially. And I certainly know that was the case with me that I was able to build a lot of support financially from people that I knew and the networks that I had cultivated um, throughout my professional career and throughout my time in the legislature, um, because it's a resource game. If you can't get your message out, it doesn't matter how good of a candidate you are. You have to be able to speak to people in a, in a broader way. I mean, it's really important to knock doors. It's really important to go to community events and to be seen that way, but you just can't get to everybody. And so you, you have to be able to get your message out financially and, and that can be a challenge, but if you have a good network of support um, and you build that support of people around you, it's gonna be a lot easier. I would say if it's a small race like mine, you pull out your phone, your iPhone, you export that list and you start putting the dollar amount next to your friends and family. <laughs> and the reason why I say that, because it then gives you a potential where your resources are first, because your first calls for fundraise are gonna be the friends and family. Those are the people who will believe in you, who will basically give you their left arm, their shirt. And if they're not, if they're unable to give you something financially, could you do this for me? Could you introduce me to this person? Could you be my volunteer coordinator? Could you do these things for me? Do you know someone in this neighborhood that's a good person that can get me connected? Because then you start resource mapping where you are. And I think that's the hardest thing as a candidate is resource mapping and understand where it is. Because when I approach the conversation with persons who are already in elected office, the conversations were, I've worked with you before behind the scenes, you know my work ethic. I wanna build relationships. I connected to you in a way that understands that like, I understand your role, whether you be a state senator or you ex congressman or a member of the city council currently. I can be a partner in this work. This is where I stand. And then that's how you start building those relationships because at the end of the day, to get support of the elected officials is like, do they like you and can they work with you? <laughs> because at the end of the day, there are some people I don't agree with, but I can work with them. And that's where you start building those relationships, but understanding where you currently have your resources and then realizing that every day, every hour, every minute, it needs to be spent in an election for either fundraising, talking to voters. That is the only thing <laughs> that you should be focused on and that your team is focused on everything else including strategy. For me, I was a campaign manager. So I found a strategist that just gave me the roadmap and I just I just did it. And if I deterred from it, I let them know. Because the thing is, is that as people who ran campaigns, you tend like, oh, I do it this way. And it's more like now trusting someone to do the roadmap, the campaign plan for you, the finance plan for you, you just follow it. That's why I have to hire a fundraiser. It's like, I can't just fundraise on my own. And you start, you start using their connections and start having those conversations. So resource map, find the people that you know and use it to your advantage to see where the landscape is for yourself. I'll kind of pivot back to the original question too about uh, you know dealing with people with more seniority than you. You know, as a young person, actually, I think being a young lawyer, you have some built-in credibility. Um, the fact that you have a law degree, they seem to sort of just trust that you will do well in the role in a way that maybe other young people might struggle with. But honestly, I mean, I've seen sort of in all the roles that I've held, it seems like. For the most people, even people with seniority are excited to have young people involved, right? That's what they want. They want the next generation to uh, to take on these roles and, and to consider, uh, you know, what what's the future holds for them. So, you know, I I think that actually is one not a huge concern. I think that you'll if you present yourself well, um, you know, and like I said, being a young lawyer, I think you have some built-in credibility, and I just don't think that that's going to be one of the major uh, detriments to uh, become, you know, to, to pursuing elected office or other types of leadership positions. So social media has kind of taken on a life of its own in terms of uh, exposure and the ability to reach people. People. And it's something, you know, that the younger generations are expected to be very familiar with and usually are fairly comfortable with. And when we talk about raising funds, social media sometimes can be a way to try and reach more people for maybe a less cost. Can you guys give us some advice, maybe some good things about social media that we should be looking at to use if running a campaign and some things to make sure that we are careful to avoid? Don't read the comment sections. <laughs> because it can get very, uh, very mean spirited at times, you know, especially 
maybe not as much in local races, uh, but definitely statewide race. I think it definitely can happen in local races too. Don't get me wrong. Um, Cause I'm sure there's experiences here that people can talk about that haven't been very good. But for, for when I was running the statewide race for governor for a while, I was reading the comments and, you know, when it was positive comments, you were kind of getting a, a positive hit, you know, like, Oh, that feels good. And then you start seeing the negative ones. And I found that it really was affecting me uh, in a way that I didn't like. Um, and so I actually just quit reading comments at all. Um, you know, with a statewide race, you're going to have a communications director that is going to be helping with posts and, and doing things like that. And so having a good team that's going to kind of shelter you from some of the negative things that affect you um, emotionally and mentally is really important because when you're running a race, you have to be able to be your best self. You know, you have to be out there um, putting a smile on your face and, you know, being a, being a leader and showing people, you know, that, that you're the right person for the job. And if you're, um, you know, focused on the comments of social media and people that are saying things that they'd never say to your face, you know, that everybody's really tough behind a, behind a screen and they would never say it to your face, but they're saying it there, but it still, it still affects you. So I think, I think social media can be great. Uh, it, it, it is the future probably of, for a lot of, in a, in a lot of ways of getting a message out, just more and more people are moving to social media and that's not just Facebook anymore. It's, it's Instagram and TikTok and Twitter and, you know, just a lot of different variations that you kind of have to use. And I think it is the future. I mean, just less and less people are, are watching TV, even they're using streaming devices. And so campaigns will change with that uh, as time goes on. And so you definitely have to use them and they're a really good thing to use because you can target your audience and you can uh, get to a lot of people for uh, more effectively and cheaper than you might through, you know, say a TV ad. Um, but if I could just impart anything is just stay away from, stay away from the comments uh, because it, it, you know, they're not the ones running the race, you're running the race. And you know who you are and you need to stick to your values and don't let what people are going to say um, affect who you are. Social media lies to people. <laughs> and I say that in the sincerest form that people are in their silos in social media. And I'll, I'll use my race, for example. I had a person who was very popular on social media who was out there. It's like, I'm doing these things. And I really posted um, my location. So reviewing their social media, I knew where they had gone. And I knew where we were. I knew what the landscape was. So social media can overtell what your campaign is doing, but also can tell us undertell what your campaign is doing as well. So I knew something was up when I was still knocking doors on my second. So I, you do multiple rounds in a campaign. So you do your first knock to get through. And then you go to second knock to return to those persons who say yes, but also do follow up persons who you haven't talked to yet, right? And on that second knock, I'm still the first candidate to the door. I knew that I had an advantage on knocking doors and that this person was lying to the public about where they were and what they were knocking. So I kept using it to my advantage. And then when COVID shut us down, I started using um, um, the auto dollar. So I can start talking to as many people as possible spending almost eight hours a day on that and hiring people to do that. But outside of that, we did something different too. We pulled down all, since we can, they said we couldn't do door knocking, we focus on targeted Facebook ads. Um, the best thing about Facebook and Instagram, they're, they mirrored together. So we just pull a list of voters that we know in the district in certain age range and knew what messaging we we're gonna do. We put pictures and messages in front of their faces three times a week. So not only am I knocking your door, I'm calling you. I'm in your social media every day too. <laughs> and it's cheap to be there too, because I can spend $3,000 and hit 7,000 people and I'm not have to repeat the message. And at the end of the campaign towards the end, because our I think our election was on June 2nd, um, I called a woman on June 1st. was like, hey, I just want to call and see if I can count on your vote. You haven't turned your ballot in yet. She goes, I've seen your social media ad. I've received your text messages. I've gotten your phone call. You knocked my door. I've gotten all your mail. You got my vote. You beat me down. <laughs> 
and that's how it is. It's and and I had to I had to I hate to say this. Social media helps with repetition. So if you're starting off and you're trying to find a niche or get a certain sort of group of supporters, it's a great way if you do targeted media ads. Reading the comments is not great for you. I stop reading comments. My staff reads comments now, unless it's something where it is a constituent issue. I do not respond. The reason why is because if you get in arguments on social media, it's going to get a screenshot. That screenshot then goes, becomes viral. But also, you can't control the the way it's received through the message that you respond to. But what you can do is control the narrative through what you do after you see those comments. And be mindful of that and check in with people about how they feel about things. That's why if I see something on social media in a certain community, I'll call community leaders and random voters in that community and ask them questions. What that does, it allows me to get con have conversations with them, but it shows that I care. I'm like, hey, I've heard these things. This is really happening. How can I help you, right? That's how you then show leadership, but not responding to negativity. It shows proactiveness. It says I'm receptive and I'm willing to be there. I would add that, you know, I think what's really nice about social media is, first of all, it's a free medium, um, but also it allows you to personalize yourself in a way and show you, you know, who you really are as a person, because in campaigns that actually really matters. Um, as lawyers, we are kind of analytical thinkers. We're thinking about the statistics. We're thinking about this and that policy wise, but it honestly comes down to who do they like? Do they like you? Do they trust you uh, to act on, on their behalf? And social media really kind of allows you to let those people into your life. Um, you know, in a way that you're comfortable with. And so I think that's like the good thing about social media. Um, and then sort of like we've already hit at the divisiveness on social media is obviously the downside. And I think you have to be really conscientious to avoid, you know, getting into that trap um, because really social media can be a great way for people to really get to understand who you are as a person and, and get to know and like you and feel like they really know you, even if, you know, they maybe never even met you. You know, one of the things that was different with 2016 compared to my, my state treasurer race in 2020 is here in Washington state, we actually had some restrictions go into place in terms of the use of social media um, and the ability of uh, Facebook, uh, especially, but, but all social media to operate and reach people uh, in a larger context. Well, in 2016, there were none of those restrictions. Um, and, you, you know, it, it doesn't take a whole lot to remember that that election in terms of 2016 and and everything that was uh, going on at that point and social media was definitely a, a big part of that but you know I, I guess going back to some of the comments from James earlier is you know I, I'm also a big believer in in doorbelling or what we call doorbelling the west coast and they call it door knocking uh, on the east coast which which might explain what different technology was developed in various parts of the, uh, the country uh, but it's um, you, you know as a part of the doorbell I mean you know I personally knocked in over 15 15,000 doors in my first state treasurer race which is kind of what you you, you have to do when you're running against uh, in a, in a come to that race, but what's great about social media in in that situation is it's not that someone's going to vote for you or not based on if they saw your ad on social media, unless it was a really good ad, maybe you had some good 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 multimedia to it or something like that. But you know, as James is pointing out, it, it's kind of reinforcement. If if if, if someone is knocked on your door, and then suddenly you're showing up in their feed, well, it actually adds credibility to you as a candidate. They're like, oh, I I know that person. That person actually came to my door. Um, and I think that there, there's that, that repetition that, that he's talking about where you know, I think that can be particularly helpful um, in, in really kind of, uh, you know, it adds to that, that, that personal contact that you, you may have had either at the door or however you um, uh, it actually had that personal exchange with somebody. So, but, but uh, as well, I mean, it's, it, in a lot of ways, it is the future in terms of uh, as, as things uh, develop. One thing I will point out related to the comment section and things like that, I once had a political mentor tell me that, you know, he, he cares about um, negative comments that come from people who actually know him. So if it's friends or family and they have something to say about something you're doing wrong, uh, he, he cares a lot about that. But if it's someone who doesn't really know you, uh, then they have a real hard time uh, speaking critically about you in, in any meaningful way. And, it, you know, he, he said that has served him well in really trying to to kind of break down those things that that um, that 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 you know that that he listens to in in, in a meaningful way, uh, but but it's tough. I mean, you're you're constantly being bombarded. You're, you're getting hit over the head all the time, uh, and you know it's obviously one of the negative parts of, of having to run for office. For some of our young lawyers who may be considering running for office and just trying to kind of see what's out there, do you guys have any recommendations on? 
what kind of opportunities to take part in to just kind of see what it's like or get an idea whether it's you know uh, volunteer opportunities or stuff that you guys maybe participated in before you decided okay I'm in now that you could share with everybody. I can go. Um, you know, I think this isn't necessarily directly response to your question, but it's something that I think we for sure want to leave here today is thinking about um, so many legal positions um, that are public uh, involve campaigns, right? Um, whether that's state's attorney or circuit court judges or state attorney general. Um, you know, I think sometimes we kind of forget about that. A lot of those positions, and obviously it's different from state to state, um, but a lot of those positions, if you want them, you have to run for office. So um, getting involved in your political party who can help, uh, you know, connect you with campaigns, uh, just be volunteering for campaigns, uh, volunteering for, you know, st state bar associations, like, for example, the Trial Lawyers Association might have a PAC. Uh, you know, there's different connections that you can make. Uh, to sort of get an, at the ground level. But I just wanted to make sure that we were making the point that it's not really just about all these political offices like city council or school board or state legislature or governor or US Senate. Um, you know, there are actual, you know, real implications for lawyers who want to take on those bigger positions. And if you want to be a judge in a state like ours, you can run. Uh, you know, for the, and the voters can vote and select you for that position. So, you know, you, you, we, we need to think of uh, these campaigns and in in, for the non-political uh, races as well. And again, that kind of varies from state to state, but it is something to keep on your radar. If you, if those are positions that you'd like to seek in your, in your future, um, you know, getting involved in, in, in campaigns, you know, on the smaller scale is a really great way to start. I think just looking at it from a, a community service aspect, you know, some of the most successful uh, political leaders are just, they started as very service oriented members of their community. So whether that's helping with community projects or organizing in your community for something that's important or just service on local boards or nonprofits, you know, things like that. And that's a really good place to start because you're going to find out a lot about yourself serving in those capacities. You're going to, you're kind of dipping your toe in the water to some degree to see like, do I, do I enjoy this? Uh, because I think some people maybe jump, um, I don't want to say jump too soon, but maybe get in a little over their head by running for a position that is much higher and they may have a bad experience because um, maybe they weren't prepared for that, or maybe they, they thought, it was going to be something that it wasn't. So I usually encourage people to get involved locally, which is also going to make you way more successful when you do decide to run. If you do decide you enjoy that service aspect, you're you're you will have built your network right there in your local community. And those are people that are going to support you because they they saw you, they know you, they trust you. And so then when you do decide to run for um, the legislature or for you know, city council or something like that, you're going to already have that base of support because you were showing them that you can serve and you can be a leader at that level. And so I think that's usually a really good way. We have a leadership institute that we focus on um, having our leaders take on a community engagement project. So they actually have to choose a project and work to complete that within a year time period because it, it builds connections, it's action oriented, and it shows people that you're for real. And I think that's kind of the first step in building that base of support and to help you decide if it's something you're really passionate about and that you will really truly care about it. You know, I, I think young lawyers do a lot of good things and the volunteer and work that they do, whether it's in uh, organized bars like the ABA or whether it's uh, a part of uh, advocating for civil legal aid locally or a range of issues, it, you, you do a lot of good stuff. And it, sometimes we forget uh, how, how impressive that work is to the average voter, right? I mean, you're, you're touching on, uh, you know, advocating for people's rights. You're, you're touching on making sure that people's benefits are protected. You're working to make sure that, that the constitution is, is preserved. And it's sometimes easy to, because it's just kind of part of our ethos or you know, some of the, the work we do as, as young lawyers, I, I think we forget that we can, that really translates in, in a way that if, if it 
can help tell the story of ways you've, you've served the community it can be in a me very meaningful way and in a way that also uh, touches a lot of issues that people care about. Um, and so I think there, there are ways definitely to be involved as a young lawyer uh, and many ways that people are involved in young lawyers that I think it's then important to then translate that uh, to voters as, as an example of service. For our young lawyers who are starting this foray, uh, maybe you could share with us some of the unexpected or surprising things that happen during campaign processes, just things that we might not think of naturally that surprised you all that we should look out for. I would jump in just, so I don't know, um, some of you may or may not have heard of um, Tom Daschle. He was a Senator from South Dakota for quite a while. He was the majority leader at one point. And one of the first piece of advice that he told me that ended up being so true that it, it, when he told me, I was like, ah, you know, I don't know, I don't know about that. He said, it will surprise you, the people that you thought would never support you that do, and the people you thought that would always support you and don't. And that ended up being so true because I made some of the weirdest connections with people that I thought would never support me in a million years. You know, people across the aisle that were not of my party that were maybe, you know, I just never would have imagined that they would support me. And then I had people that I've known my entire life that couldn't support me either, they said, because of my party affiliation. Even though they'd known me forever and I would even ask him, I'd say, well, so if I was, if I had, I had the same beliefs, but I was, you know, a registered R, that you would vote for me? And they would say yes. And so it, it, it was, I'm glad that I had thought about that prior to the race because it would have been really jarring because as soon as I had those conversations and I, I, I right away went back to what Senator Dashwood had told me, I was like, hmm, I'm glad I thought about that. And I'm glad he told me that because this would have been pretty frustrating in some instances and, and really surprising in others. My biggest surprise was the U.S. mail. <laughs> I'm gonna say this because um, everyone in campaign knows that your mail campaign is important. The U.S. mail and I had a very long conversation because when my mail dropped, it was off a few days and then it helped that they delayed something later because it made the message better. Because <laughs> at the same time the news story dropped, my mail hit your mailbox and it's just it's one of those things where you have I tell people that you're going to be shocked about processes that you once you once you once you execute some things are not in your control and when you think about it you just have to be prepared for those moments when you execute it's not in your control you can't uh I'd say that you can't control the fact that the building location may be closed because pipes burst so how do you adapt and move forward? And then similar to Billy, I, I, I'm in an interesting mix of a district because I have some very conservative Democrats who vote Republican. Um, and one of them actually asked me did I support the then president at the time? And I said, I prayed for him. And that person goes, I thought you were just gonna come out and say impeach the man. I said, no, I said, I prayed for him because his success is my success. His failures are my failures. And that's why it's important that you make sure you connect with people in terms of who you are as a person, because you're not gonna always agree with them. I tell people, you're not gonna always try to convince someone to vote for you based off of like, this is what I believe. It's more so, these are my values, this is who I am, and I will listen to you. And that's why I tell people, when you execute, be mindful that you may not control the mess, you may not control the outcome, but, or the process isn't, but think about how you make that connection. So campaigns are, I mean, just kind of crazy. There's always gonna be unsuspecting things that pop up and that's actually sort of what makes them fun, right? So you have to kind of be ready for that. 
Um, but I would say, you know, to, for me, I guess in my personal experience as a candidate, um, I was actually more like uh, most of my surprises were positive ones. It wasn't surprising how enriching having all these conversations were. Um, it was surprising how, yeah, you sort of just build this network and you feel more connected to your community after, uh, you know, talking to so many voters at the door or on the phone. And um, so for me, most of the surprises were pretty positive, but you definitely have to be ready for surprises if you decide to run for office. You know, I guess I'll I'll just follow up. I you know I think um, I think Susie's spot on. I mean, you know, the, the, the things you don't expect to happen happen. Things that you expect to happen don't happen. Uh, it's kind of uh, you know what, what what makes it interesting and, and terrifying at the same time. Uh, but it's uh, it, you know for me, I mean, you know, I always just think back to my 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 first race. Uh, you know, five years ago now, or four year four or five years ago. Um, you know, when I was running for the House, I mean, it ended up being that our race was going to decide the balance of, of power in our state legislature. Um, if, if we won the race, one party would control the entire, or if we lost the race, one party would control the entire legislature. That's the other party. Um, you know, I'm a Democrat. Um, uh, but, but if we won, then we actually would, would hold the, the House of Representatives by, by one seat. Um, that was not expected when I first ran. Uh, but it kind of sometimes things shake out like that. And so it ended up being a very uh, contentious race, as you might imagine. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of interest uh, in, in things like the balance of power of legislatures um, and a lot of resources go into that. And so it was a, a, a contentious race you know, for, that, for that reason. Um, that was not expected. <laughs> um, and, and I think that you just have to you know, stay on message and make sure that the reason why you're running is what continues to push you forward. And that eventually kind of will hopefully get you across the finish line. So I know James had mentioned running a campaign, you know, during COVID, the COVID era, and I think that transitioning to some virtual presence is going to stick around with us as we as we come out of this. But, um, you know, for young lawyers, if, if we're not successful in our first time around, what do you guys suggest in in the meantime before the next election or in and or how do you guys see the campaign landscape changing as a result of the pandemic, if at all? Well, from a, you know, from a practical perspective, I think we're going to see a lot more early voting. Um, that's sort of a really changed, right? So the way we interact changed during the pandemic, but also you saw states across the country who maybe didn't have as uh, aggressive early voting options are now pursuing that. So I think that's really going to change the way you, the way you actually physically run campaigns and, and when you are doing persuasion and when you're doing turnout and that sort of thing. So that's something that, you know, is, is, is a good thing, right? It gives people more opportunities uh, to vote and to vote sooner, uh, but campaigns have to adjust. You almost have to be more organized more early and you know put the leg in work put the legwork in earlier in the campaign um you know for the most part um i, I think that the the changes that we saw because of covid um it, it's probably going to be you know similar opportunities like i say for early voting that sort of thing um how do, how do you give it another shot if you tried once um in, in in this really different environment it wasn't successful honestly it's the things we already talked about just getting involved in your community um you know finding yourself on boards continuing to build your network and just being really visible in your community uh, because as more events open up and you, you have more opportunities to get out there you really have the opportunity to make more connections um, in person and those can be really meaningful and impactful so i'd say that'd be something to really focus on as we are all able to start convening together in person again so maryland was not a vote by mail state but turned into a vote by mail state so all of my voter IDs or supporter codes went out the door <laughs> because now I have to, at my campaign went from being show up to your poll, be on time, get them, pull you out and worry about early voting. It then switched to making sure your ballot gets back in time and signed properly. <laughs> and so I can get the vote counts. So we had to, we we budgeted for a seventy thousand dollar race, that then turns into a ninety thousand dollar race because doing vote by mail added twenty thousand dollars onto it because now we have to change our phone campaign to tracking when you submitted your ballot, following up on your ballot, did you sign your ballot, um, creating social media ads that taught you how to fill out your ballot, <laughs> and targeted towards our voters to make sure it stayed in front of them. 
But on top of that, the other piece was is that no one ever did a vote by mail before. So we're all like, wait, we're ID shift. And then because the we didn't have time to clean the list, we're tracking like which ballots were returned. So we know that like, what is the universe of voters that do not have ballot addresses anymore? How do we get you to cure your um, address so you can get a ballot? How do we then, if you mail in your ballot and it was not accepted, how do we cure your ballot then and get it back, get that back in so we get, get that vote counted? So it switched into being a absentee ballot campaign where we had three separate campaigns happening at one time and making sure that we stayed on top of it. And then we, it got to the point where like we didn't know the results from the vote by mail until June 10th based off of the returns and the numbers we had from precincts, we knew that we had an 800 vote um, margin that gave us cushion. So we're looking at the returns and looking at our numbers, like we think we have it. There's 2000 votes outstanding. And then once we got down to that last thousand votes and we were at 1200 votes ahead, it had to be a miracle for someone to come in and we're like, great, we know where the numbers are. We're good. We can then make the phone calls and say, hey, we're ready to transition. But without that, it you have to learn how to adapt, um, especially in COVID-19. One of the things is that we couldn't knock doors by executive order. So we had to then switch ways on how to interact with people, virtual campaigns. And then the other thing that happened was when we switched and everything shut down, funders and donors dried up <laughs> because everyone was worried about how long will this last? And we had to figure out ways how to then cut budgets and start shaving off to the point where I my team went from a team of 12 to three, just so that we can make sure we got to the end of the campaign and got our message through. So it's about adapting fast. I think I'll play devil's advocate here a little bit um, with uh, relate, related to early voting and COVID. I think there are some states that are going to and already are moving towards limiting the ability to vote by mail because they're worried about the integrity of that. And so this is one reason that I think it's probably more important than ever that we have lawyers that want to run for office and be involved because in general, uh, attorneys believe in justice and fairness. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, you're looking at it from a perspective of what is right, uh, what is fair and that, at least in my experience, is kind of the focus. And so I just think it's really important that uh, people's rights are respected as far as the ability to, to vote um, and vote early and do that kind of thing. So I do, I, so while, um, while that was a great ability for, for most states, there are states that are looking to limit those options. And in fact, in some instances, to do away with mail voting altogether. And so I think we all just all need to keep that in mind as we move forward that um, some states are looking to do that and some states are, um, you know, going to proceed with that, with that concept. And that's why it's so important for um, people that are focused on fairness and politics and honesty and integrity to then run for office to make sure that people's rights are respected. I just want to follow up on that too. I mean, I, I, I feel very strongly that it's the role of lawyers to uh, preserve our democracy and the rule of law. And, you know, this is, this is one of these moments, and I, I really appreciate Billy's comments, that it is critical that, that lawyers engage uh, however you want to engage in the political process right now because of the, um, the you know, the, the experience, expertise, and, and uh, ro particular role uh, that you have um, in, in preserving all of those things uh, that, that, that are critical to, to our democracy. And I, I think that, um, you know, there, there is a, a value in having attorneys uh, in elected office um, when laws are made, when, um, you know, issues come up, just in terms of drafting legislation. You know, one of the big things that's important for me uh, in, in all of my campaigns is getting uh, corporate campaign money out of politics. And I think what we've seen nationally is a lot of, um, th there have been organizations that have been set up that essentially write the legislation for 
state legislators around the country. And, and, and it's not unique to either, either part of the, that is done, but it is uh, an operation in terms of certain uh, special interests that exist to have their laws written in a way that serves them. And um, a lot of times that money, that there's, there's money involved in terms of different entities that, that have vested interest in those things. But also what happens is, you know, you, you have elected officials who, who aren't writing the laws themselves, uh, don't kind of have a legal eye related to the legislation. Um, and uh, it, it's that much easier for that type of influence to take place. Uh, lawyers tend to read things um, they tend to critique things, and they also can appreciate how, how laws are written. And I think that it is uh, particularly important uh, for, for, for lawyers to, to step forward, given that, that, that expertise that, that they have to, to make sure that laws are written, written in a way that best serve the, the interests of their constituents and, and the people, and not the, the special interests that just come forward with that legislation. So you all have been so wonderful sharing with us so many insights as we kind of wind down this panel. If you guys have any imparting words of wisdoms or I wish I someone had told me this as you would like to share with our young lawyers as they consider running for office. I guess I would just say to strongly consider it. You know, I, I it, it is so important. I kind of like what Mike said, you know, we've seen that in South Dakota that uh, we used to have quite a few attorneys that were in elected office back in the 80s and 90s and somewhere between then and now uh, that number has just drastically decreased and then uh, oftentimes the quality of the legislation is um, maybe not as good and then the debate isn't as good either. Um, there, a lot of times people aren't thinking for themselves and they're not thinking critically and I think attorneys have a unique way of look, you know, asking us to look at things differently. I know that because my wife is an attorney. And so <laughs> she, she does a good job of, of challenging me to, to think differently sometimes. And, and so I just think it's incredibly important um, that we have more people that are attorneys that are involved. And then I think the last piece of advice kind of goes off what James said. I felt like, I felt like he was part of our campaign when he was talking about issues versus values. Um, issues oftentimes divide, but values bring us together. Because if you can show people what your values are and, re and relate those values to other people, uh, they have a stronger connection to you because they feel like you care about them at a personal level. And, and you do, if you're doing it for the right reasons, you do care about those people. Um, and you'll find that at the end of the day, as uh, whether it's in your state or in our country, we have more in common than not. And we have a lot of the same values, but we let certain issues divide us and make us seem like we're more different than we are um, from, a, from a values standpoint. And so I just think it's really important to find connection via values um, if you're considering taking that on. Yeah, I guess I would kind of piggyback on what Billy was saying in that, um, you know, lawyers have are trained to see both sides of an argument. And I think that makes us have the ability to maybe find common ground or to at least um, try to understand where both sides are coming from. And so because of that, I think it's so important to have us as lawyers involved in, you know, whether that be school board, city council, just across the board, right, even nonprofit boards, we need uh, people uh with the of this profession and sort of all these filling all these roles so i'd say if you're thinking about it um uh, my advice do it i mean there's def def different ways to get engaged um at different levels and uh, you know get your feet wet see 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 what works for you what works with your schedule and we know we're all busy people but honestly the people who take on things like this are already busy it's just the way the world works um so so if you're interested absolutely consider doing it and you know think about your, how this actually could have major implications for your career as well like i mentioned all the legal opportunities that require campaigns another thing that i was thinking of too is federal appointments are 
political um, as well. So if you know becoming a federal judge is ever on your radar, um, being involved when in your uh, political process is actually really important as well. Uh, but you know if politics isn't for you, there's so many ways to serve. You know in the nonprofit sector and that sort of thing as well. And all of those things will prepare you and be a stepping off point for uh, whatever you decide you're passionate about. Um, and you know we're just excited to see the ways the lawyers in this country can get back to their communities and to their states and their in their nation. I have one thing, don't be afraid. Um, I think my biggest thing, even entering into a race, so when I started my race, my wife uh, was just returning off maternity leave. Our son was five months old. Um, so being that duality again comes back. And don't be afraid, but also be mindful of the fact that it will be a toll on me. I would tell you that I lost 30 pounds in my race. <laughs> all that walking, all that talking, but it's about just be mindful that like, this is gonna take a toll on like your body, your spiritual or your spirituality and your ment mentally, because at, you're gonna like, go to bed thinking about the race, you're gonna wake up thinking about the race. You're gonna be constantly distracted because something's happening. Um, but be mindful that it's okay to just I don't know, be on co I'm coast, be mindful that it's fine that you're going to suck in some areas of your life while you're running for office and that you have people there to pick it up. But also understand that, like I had the choice that I could run and then be, if nothing happens, I still have options when I, when it's over, because I could have, and I was being offered jobs to just be, use my legal education, do other things. There's opportunities elsewhere. And also, funny thing is that a lot of people who actually run and lose end up being in someone's administration or doing something else. So it might be something that you may end up wanting, wanting to do. And it may be the perfect job for you behind the scenes and leading the work and then being the detailed person. Because one of the things I struggle with is I'm very detail oriented, but I can't be in the details anymore. So like we're in the middle of budget hearings and budget sessions, there are 400 pages. <laughs> I've read all 400 pages, not all my colleagues are, but my staff is also reading as well and creating notes and creating talking points or their questions. And I'm just giving feedback. And that's on top of the fact that we have constituent issues. We have, we have bills that are currently in the council moving. So you gotta be able to say that I can let go. And then you build that trust in that team around you. And be mindful that sometimes you gotta hire people that are completely opposite of you or have skills that you don't have. I have a person who does my communications, but also does my legislation because I'm able to focus on the, the specifics. I just need someone who was organized to get it through for me. Or if I have a chief of staff, because I honestly don't have time to keep track of three people. And that person is the next person in charge that gets to keep track of everything, that does my media and talking points and all those things. But be ready to just let go and trust people but also trust yourself to know that it's a decision that is meaningful for you. And if it doesn't work out, there are other meaningful things that you can do. So we're just short on time here, but I just wanted to thank our panelists so much, James, Susie, Billy, Mike, really great points, great insights, advice. I feel we learned a lot about how to go about this uh, exciting life possibility for all of our young lawyers here. So thank you again very much for participating in the uh, Civic Engagement Summit. Again, for anybody who's interested, we are continuing more programming throughout the rest of this afternoon. At 1.30, there will be a CLE event, How to Watch the Watchmen. There's a three o'clock event, also more than a seat at the table, and 4.15, the lawyer's role in social movements. Those are all East Coast times. Um, but again, thanks so much to all of our panelists. We hope everybody enjoyed today's event and go on and enjoy the rest of your morning, the afternoon, depending on what coast you're on you are on. Thank you.